for another privilege. Thank God for another opportunity. Thank God for another Wednesday night. We're grateful that God has kept us once again. We bless the Lord for this privilege and this opportunity to be with you guys once again. We're going to open up in the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 16 is where our opening text will be tonight. Welcome all of you that are here. Welcome all of you that are watching us and viewing us live and will view us live. We welcome you here to find a few Wednesday night Bible study here at Shepherd Missionary Baptist Church. Thank God for those of you that are in the house. Thank God for those that will be with us via your teleconference tonight as well. So we're definitely grateful. We're getting ready to open up the conference line now for those of you that will be a part of us tonight via teleconference. So we're definitely grateful that God has given us another privilege another chance if you just give me one moment but the book of Matthew chapter number 16 is where our opening scripture will be Shepherd Missionary Baptist Church, welcome those of you that are with us tonight via teleconference. Thank you for your patience. We're opening up in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 16 is where our opening text will be found. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 16. And we're going to begin at verse number 22 and end off at verse 25. So for those of you that are with us live via teleconference, welcome tonight. Prayerfully that you guys can hear me well and clear. Uh, Chapter, chapter 16 of the Gospel of Matthew, beginning at verse 22, ending off at verse 25, and I'll ask Pastor Ratliff if she would open us up in prayer after our opening scripture. So again, welcome to those of you that are viewing us live via Ustream. Thank God for the live stream that God has allowed us to have for over a year. Uh, moving over from Justin TV to Ustream TV. Thank God for those of you that are present with us in the house those that will possibly come, and those of you that are with us live tonight via teleconference uh, tonight. So Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse number 22, you'll find these words. It says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Then, Je then said Jesus unto his disciples, welcome tonight, chapter 16 of the Gospel of Matthew, I'm at verse number 24 now. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. We just read you uh, verses 22 through 25 in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. That's where I open it is tonight. Those of you that are on the conference line, if you don't mind, just for a brief moment, if you would just put your phone on mute as we open up tonight. Pastor Rattler, would you open us up in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you, thank you right now for bringing us to the house We ask you to open up our hearts and open up our minds. Oh, Father God, see me where you're sitting with power. Use your servant, God. Get the glory out of his life, God. Oh, Father, we just ask you to have your way. You be honored, you be glorified. Right now, Lord Jesus, stay the word. In Jesus Christ, stand in that Amen. Amen, amen. We thank God tonight again. Those of you that are live with us via teleconference, if you would just uh, mute your phone so that we can kind of uh, get rid of some of the background noise. I do want you guys to participate. Our Bible class is an open forum. You have the opportunity and you do have the ability to ask a question, make comments as our lesson go forward. Uh, we're continuing in our series that we have been dealing with with the salvation process. 
Uh, under this heading, we have dealt with many uh, topics underneath, this, underneath the heading of salvation process. Our main heading is Introduction to the Bible, Part 2. In this particular portion of the lesson, or in this particular portion of Introduction to the Bible, Part 2, it all has to do with being able to understand each book in the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But I need us to be very, very aware tonight. I want you to understand that the Bible in its original form written was written as letters. So if by chance you don't know what chapter, don't allow that to prohibit you from thinking that you're not in the Word of God. If you don't remember exactly what verse, don't allow yourself to be bothered or troubled by the fact that you don't remember book, chapter, and verse. If you know that is written in the Word of God, then the most important thing that I need you to keep in mind right now as we build and as we grow is that the Word of God was written in letter form. It was written on three different types of, 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 of rather three different forms of writing it was done on. First of all, uh, let me back up a little bit. First of all, it was handed down by word of mouth. Second, God had it put on clay tablets. Third, it was put on parchment paper. And then finally, it was put on papyrus because papyrus was able to be able to be kept a longer time. It was able to be preserved over the years. So what was written on it, it didn't fall apart. Is why they transferred it from on the parchment paper to the papyrus paper because papyrus paper was made from the bark of a tree. And the bark of a tree, it allowed the writings or it allowed the strolls to last longer than parchment paper. So let us keep that in mind tonight. That, that's very important because what does that have to do with the salvation process? Well, it has a lot because that's part of your foundation of knowing what's in your Bible. That's a part of understanding introduction to the Bible, part two. Part one gave you a solid foundation, the books of the Bible, how the Bible came into play. But the second part that we have been dealing with, we've been dealing with the various topics under it concerning the Word of God. So we're at the salvation process. What does that mean? How do I get saved? How do I know I'm saved? What did it take for me to get to my salvation? What does the salvation process consist of? There are three major things that we've been dealing with under the salvation process. Those three major things is dealing with the fact that you were saved from the penalty of sin. That's the first part of salvation. The second part is that you're being saved from the guilt of sin. The third part of that is complete salvation, which none of us have reached that yet, even those that have died in the Lord in the hopes of his return are only resting until the final part of that salvation has been completed. And that's when Christ come back and will receive a glorified body, which no longer sin will be able to enter into. As long as you're in this body here. Let me tell you saved folk, let me tell you sanctified folk, let me tell you anointed folk, let me tell you your Holy Ghost for your folk, let me tell you folk that's fire talking and tongue talking and all of that other stuff. You're still subject to sin just like anybody that is not saved by grace. There are only two sinners that are living on the face of the earth. That's one saved by grace and that's one that is not saved by the grace of God. He's covered, she's covered until they acknowledge, accept, and receive and begin to live the way God would have them to live through his son Jesus Christ. Now, let me go back. Now, the first part of that uh, three parts that we talked about just now under the salvation process. We talked about being saved from the penalty of sin. That's your position in Christ. Your position in Christ, you're saved. The moment you confess with your mouth, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, we all are familiar with it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here's the thing. The moment you believe, you have it, but you have to live that after. You don't just have eternal life and don't have to do anything at all after that. That's a lie. Somebody have you believing that. Let me help you understand. After your mouth have confessed Paul said in the 10th chapter of Romans between verse 1 and verse number 10, he said, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that the Lord Jesus Christ died, rose and is seated at the right hand of God, thou shalt be saved. He said, with the mouth confession is made, but with the heart man believe unto salvation. Now, let me make sure you understand this. Your emotions are not enough to bring you to salvation. They may pull you towards accepting Christ, but after that, you have to mentally believe and you have to psychologically Psychologically be convinced, you have to intellectually know that Jesus Christ was both a man as well as God in one. 
And he came in the flesh, lived in the flesh, died by the flesh, rose in a glorified body, and went back to heaven after being with man for 40 days after his resurrection. If you confess that because you believe it, you're convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. At that moment, your position is salvation. Your position, you're saved. You're saved from the penalty of hell. You're saved from eternal separation from God. Now let me let me make sure I put this in there because positionally you're saved eternally to be with God forever. The second part of that, you're being saved, and that is you're spiritually set now to walk in the newness of life with God. The third part of that complete salvation it is the fact that now you are eternally in bliss with God forever, and you won't have to ever worry about the, 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 the pains of hell. What you got, baby? Forever. Ongoing, never stopping, always existing. That's what eternal means. There's no beginning and there's no end. You have three deaths. You have a physical death, you have a spiritual death, and eternal death. At the moment of salvation, we all abided in death because we didn't love our brother. And if you don't believe it, if you want to know how you're saved, the gospel that John wrote, along with his epistles, you'll find in there the remedy and the formula for how you know you're saved. In the gospel of John, as well as in the epistle of John, he says, and we know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. I'm helping you out tonight for you to understand. In this salvation process, in your position in Christ, which is be, which is saved or salvation, that moment you are now removed from the eternal separation of God and brought back into fellowship with him through his son at that moment you don't have to worry about being eternally damned forever am I making sense tonight positional progressive and complete those are the three main intricate components of salvation or in the salvation process. Here's the thing that happened after you get saved. Now that you have received eternal life and it's guaranteed to you through Jesus Christ, you now have to live the life. It's just like a baby. As long as the mother's carrying that baby for nine months, some babies are born premature. They come in this world before they expect the time that they're to be born. Even if that happened in salvation, you still now have to be nurtured. Mama have to make sure that that you're protected. Daddy has to make sure that you're protected. Mama make sure you get the proper nourishment, the right kind of food. You have the right type of garments on your body to protect you from the elements that are around you. Same thing spiritually. Now that you have been born of God. John in the third chapter, we go back to the beginning of it. It says that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He had a nightly meeting. He was in salvation. He believed in Jesus Christ. But because of where and what position he held, like some people in our world today, depending on where they are and what position they hold, they are undercover Christians. In the salvation process, there is no need for you to be in hiding and believe in God because it's impossible to be a believer and hide and believe at the same time. He didn't hide to save you. He didn't hide to die. He didn't hide when he rose. In secret did he do nothing, he said, and openly he spoke to the world. So these three parts of salvation that we've been dealing with in the salvation process is important. The first thing you've got to be drawn, John chapter 6. Let me move ahead and I'll come back to the third chapter and deal with Nicodemus a little bit more. But in order to come, you have to be led. The sixth chapter of John, I believe it's somewhere between cha chapter 6 of John, between verse 40 and verse 44, it says that the Spirit of God has to draw you unto Christ. The 14th chapter, John chapter 6, verse 44, I believe it is. Somebody find it for me real quick. Thank you, right. John chapter number 6. That's the same thing St. John of the Gospel of John. It's the same thing, son. John chapter 6. Does that make sense to anybody tonight? Welcome to Night Caller. John chapter 6, this first part of salvation, which is where you are saved from the penalty of sin. All of us are deserving of death. Y'all know that, right? Yeah. All of us should be dead, right? Yeah. All of us, because of our sinful nature, deserve to be in hell. Y'all do realize that, right? Now, I'm not telling nobody that they're going to hell, but I want you to understand your position in Christ is salvation. He saved you from the penalty of death. That's why Paul said, for the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So the first part of salvation, something had to bring you. Something had to get you there. Something had to draw you there. And from the old to the new, God was searching for his creation, which was man. 
And in his search for man, he gave him shadows in the old. In the 39 books that were there, they depicted or they were types of Christ or shadows of Christ or the image of what Christ would be when he came in the natural to draw us back in relationship with God. Am I making sense tonight? Mm -hmm. And in that now, his death or his birth, now leading up to his death, saved us from the death that we should have incurred. But in the 6th chapter of John, verse 44, I believe it says something to the veil that the Spirit of God had to draw us unto God through Christ. The 6th verse of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John states that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to God but by him. Am I making sense? So now, before we could even get there, something had to draw us. But in that drawing effect, something had to be placed in us. Let me take you back to Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 34. In that 34th verse of the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, when God begins to talk about his new covenant that he's going to make with Israel, just as he said in Isaiah, as he said as well as in Ezekiel, he was going to make a new covenant. In the 31st chapter and the 34th verse of, of, of Jeremiah, he says, from all of them, from the least of them to the greatest of them shall know me. He said, no longer will it be said, know ye the Lord. And every man had to teach his neighbor and teach his brother, said, know ye the Lord. He said, they all going to know me. There's going to come a time because the covenant that I will make, I'm going to make sure that when they come in this world, they know who I am. There's no excuse. Am I making sense tonight? Mm -hmm. Y'all talk to me. Somebody trying to say something tonight on the line? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm listening. Can you hear me? So now, let's make it clear tonight. Let's, let's understand it tonight. Let's understand that now here, he said it in the play. It was set in the ring, and then it came into play. And in that, he said, they all shall know me from the least unto the greatest. Mm -hmm. How is that going to be so? Because he was going to put himself in that inward part. So in other words, when you were birthed into this world through your parents, through your mother, your father and mother came together, now you have been conceived, you have been made, you have been born. When you came in this world, you had a knowledge of who God was and nobody had to teach you. You had a better understanding as you began to grow along, but that was a natural desire and a natural connotation to be drawn to God because he had already placed himself in you. Am I making sense? Yeah. So in the salvation process, brothers and sisters, it is evident and it is clear. The first part, he saved us from death. We were supposed to. We should have. We ought to be right now. But because of the relationship that we have in him through Christ, because of Christ, and sealed by the Spirit of God, we have salvation. And I'm doing that because I need to make sure it's clear. Because in order to understand the reason why we pray, because everybody pray, an atheist pray. An atheist will call upon God. An unbeliever will call upon God. An unbeliever will begin to cry out unto Jesus Christ. But you have to have some relationship. But even in that, if there is no relationship because God loves his creation, he will hear and use that as the drawing to, to draw them back to himself. Am I making sense? Is that clear? So the first part of salvation is you're saved from the pillage. That's your position. Here now, in your salvation and in the process of your salvation, that is a progression that has to take place. In other words, you have to grow. After that baby has been born into the world, the rest of its development or the rest of its growth now takes place outside of the mother's womb. Am I making sense now? So progressively, I have to now feed off of what will nourish me, but also I have to rely on my mother in the beginning stages to make sure that the proper food is fed to me and I receive it in the manner or in the increments that I can handle. Jesus said he gave every man according to the measure of faith. In other words, according to the level where you are or according to the maturity that you are in at that particular moment depicts where your strength would be at. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. He said, I give you pastors according to my heart to feed you with knowledge and understanding. And in that, that means now I'm going to become or I'm in essence going to be like a mother. 
I have to make sure that I feed you because he said after salvation, Peter said that we ought to desire the sincere milk of the word of God. In other words, we ought to desire the simple nutrients of the word of God to build us and strengthen us in our faith, to understand who Jesus is and why we follow after Christ. And as I begin to feast of all of those simple principles, now I can begin to understand the gift that the Spirit of God may have given me. He may have given me the gift of knowledge. He may have given me the gift of wisdom. He may have given me the gift of healers. He may have given me the gift to be able to speak in tongues, interpret tongues. He may have given me the gift of faith. But to understand that, welcome caller, I have to build off the simple foundations of my belief. Welcome caller. So now, welcome evangelist. God bless. In that, in this progressive state of your salvation, in the salvation process, the second part is imperative because you're being saved from the guilt of sin. In other words, now that you have come to Christ, you no longer have to worry about the fact that you told a lie 20 years ago if you asked God for forgiveness and you begin to practice the truth. Mm -hmm. Paul said to the church in Ephesus chapter 4, he said, if you once was a liar, cease from lying and practice the truth. If you once had a means of getting what you wanted by only giving a partial part of what the truth was in reference now to gain what you wanted to get from the person illegally or deceptively, he said if that's what you did prior to salvation and if that's what you were doing while in salvation, you now need to cease from doing these things because you are only deceiving yourself. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense tonight? Mm -hmm. Let me back up in chapter 4. Because he says, here now in your salvation walk. See, a lot of us have been around a, lot, a whole lot of ministries, right? And they've been giving us a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They've been feeding us this and feeding us that. Feeding us what we have told them we were lacking. Feeding us what we told them that we were looking for. Giving us what they wanted to give us so that they could hook us in. And now that they hooked us in, now they begin to put out the program that they really wanted. It really wasn't about my soul. It really wasn't about my maturity. It really wasn't about my goal. It really wasn't helping me to understand what area of ministry I was to walk in. What it really was about was to make sure that I had control and you gave me what I wanted to build who I am while I held you where you were. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. The reason why I, I alluded to the beginning of the fourth chapter, he said we should no longer be children. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along that you grow up because in the process, in your progressive state of your salvation, being saved from the guilt of sin, now you don't have to hold your head down because you made a mistake but you got up. In getting up, you ask for forgiveness. In asking forgiveness, God will give you a piece of knowing that now what you did has been in past tense, and now you're back in present tense, where you were separated at that moment because you allowed your flesh and your lust of your flesh to pull you to do whatever. And while doing it, you did that apart from the will of God because you followed your will. When you asked, you got back in restore. Am I making sense? Now, in that, he said, be no more children tossed to and fro, because see, we don't want to be planted nowhere, because if we are reprimanded, if we are put in a place to where now we are told that we are wrong, we get upset with the man or the woman of God, and we leave this ministry and go to another ministry, and we have not grown nowhere, because we ain't been planted anywhere. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Going into a ministry doesn't mean you're going to be there for life. Going into a ministry, you're there for the life expectancy that God gave you so that where you are, they can feed you with the knowledge and understanding. And he's already fitted the man or woman of God where you are to know when his time or her time has been up. And they've caused you to grow to the level where God wants you to be. And now it's time to send you out, not make you stay, not make you sit. But my job is to develop you, help you to understand what being a disciple is or a learner of Christ. Understand Understanding the ways of Christ, being able to love like Christ, being able to handle people like Christ, and understand that it ain't about you, but it's about Christ. Mm -hmm. So in your progressive state of salvation, now I understand why I'm saved. Because I'm deserving of death. Mm -hmm. I used to be the biggest alcoholic, but now God can remove the desire and the taste and the hunger from alcohol because he changed my mind or my thoughts process that made me feel that I needed some chemical altering of my process of thinking to make me feel accepted or feel like somebody. Am I making sense? To put it plain and simple? So now he said no longer be two children tossed to and fro. Don't be running everywhere because you ain't getting here but you're getting it over there. Don't, don't run over 
over there, and because they are not prophesying, you leave and you think God is not there, and you run when they prophesy. Don't run over here because they ain't speaking in tongues here, but they're speaking in tongues over there. But you have no earthly idea what they're saying and what spirits they've conjured up and what demons now have attached themselves to you. Am I making sense? Uh -huh. But before you can get to that meat, you got to understand why you walk. Have you actually established a relationship because when a baby is first born, they make sure that they bring the baby to the mother so that the baby and the mother can have a bonding, but it can pick up the natural sin to know that this is my mother. Whoever the baby is in contact with it first born, that's who they're going to begin to gravitate to or begin to attach themselves to because that is the natural thing that happens. They're drawn to the first one. Ladies, am I making sense in the way now? So now in that progressive state, he said, no longer be little children. Somewhere along the way, your mentality should be growing. Mm -hmm. You should be able to recognize right from wrong what is God and what's not God. What well, is a word that is coming as a life-giving word and what is really prophetic and what is pathetic. Did y'all catch that? I, I caught it. Let me put it to you like this. Because your ears are itching for a word from the Lord, and I know God has given me a gift. And see, some folk get the gift of knowledge and the gift of wisdom mixed up with prophecy because God gave them some foreknowledge or knowledge of who you were or something about you, and you were able to speak by the Holy Ghost because it was the Holy Ghost that gave you the gift. And now they believe that they prophesied because they told you some things that they had no knowledge of, and God gave them divine revelation that at that moment and allow them to special revelate and see some other things that were not there to their knowledge to help you get where you need to get and they thought they prophesied but they didn't understand what prophecy was and they thought that's what they were doing because you knew you were looking for a word but you didn't understand you already had the word can I back it up a little bit further? Ephesians chapter number 3. If I back up verse number 20, Paul said, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, whereby the power that worketh in us. What power is that? The word of God and the spirit of God. At the moment of salvation, not only do I receive eternal life, but I receive it in the wedding of the third part of the Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit of God. And when he feels me, he begins to change what and how I used to think and see things, how I perceived it. In other words, how I heard it, how I processed it in my mind, how I now begin to see it with my eyes, and how I begin to act this thing out now that I've heard, I've processed, I've saw it again, and now I'm acting upon it, the manner in which that is given, the Spirit of God will give you understanding. Let me back up to Romans, chapter number 12, verse number 2. Because in this progressive state of salvation, Paul said, and be not conformed to this world, right? What does that have to do with Ephesians 3 and 20? What does it have to do with progressively being saved? Well, it has a lot because I need to back up to verse, to chapter 8, where he says that who can bring a charge against the elect of God? Now that I'm saved and I ask God for forgiveness, you can't hold nothing against me even though you know what I did. Because if I know for myself and I'm assured in the peace in my mind that God forgave me, you can say all day long how big of an alcoholic I was, how big of a drug addict I was. You can tell me that you lied to me 20 minutes ago. You lied 20 minutes ago, I did. But I came back and rectified the lie that I told. Irregardless of what was my means to telling the lie, if you said you forgave me, why are you holding it against me? But if God forgave me and not holding it, why are you holding it? Baby. That's right. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense to anybody tonight? Mm -hmm. So progressively, I learned how to begin to walk because that baby, it, before it walks, it crawls. Mm -hmm. Well, some babies, because some babies, for some reason, they have the ability that they just get up one day, stand up on their little legs, and they start walking. Mm -hmm. Others, they're in it because they're enabled by the parent that's always holding and cuddling them. Is it wrong to do that? No. But sometimes if we hold them too close, they won't know how to stand on their own. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. If we continue to always spoon feed you, but never tell you and teach you the purpose of the spoon, how to handle the spoon, the use of the spoon, and how to use the spoon, you'll never feed yourself. 
I can pray for you all day long as your leader, but my job is to teach you how to get in a relationship and communicate with God for yourself. Because you'll find yourself in peril, needing me, and may not get in touch with me, and you don't know how to pray, and you may make the wrong decision. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So progressively, I don't have to feel guilty because I didn't, I didn't know how to pray. I, I joined this church, but they didn't teach me anything. They, they're not teaching. They want my time. They want my offer. They want my time. They want my gift. They want my talent. And they learned how to sideways drill into my anointing, but never showed me the anointing that I had. They sideways drilled into my gifting, and they're operating off my gift, and I'm trying to figure out why I'm always drained at the end of service. And when I go home, I find myself naturally sick because I've been spiritually drain and my spiritual immune system that is supposed to keep my natural man strong and enhance my natural immune system has been depleted because I allowed somebody else to suck me dry. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So progressively, in my progressive walk, go ahead, somebody, somebody's talking, go ahead. Somebody had a comment or question? I, I, I'm, I'm going to give it a break. That's, that's what this is all about. So progressively, I'm learning how to stand on my own. Mm -hmm. Mama may have breastfed me, and in breastfeeding a baby, two things happen. It, it causes the mother now to stay sterile so another child is not born, mm -hmm. but it helps the child in developing its immune system, its circulatory system, its skeletal system, its digestive system. It helps to build it, it, its, its nervous system. It gives it the nourishment that it needs so that the antibodies that its little body have not learned to develop and use yet through the breast milk of the mother, it helps now them to stay attached to where they came while they build to where they're going. In the beginning of your salvation, we get excited. We run the church every time the church door open, and we haven't understood what church is. First of all, let me help you understand. The first part of your salvation is positional, and at that moment, you become the church. Because he told Peter in that 16th chapter where we opened up, he said, And thou art Peter, and upon this rock, your faith calls you to become the church. Okay. That is a part of a larger church, which is many members that make up the church. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? I ain't lost nobody, huh? Mm -hmm. So in that now, I understand when I first get saved, I am the church. Mm -hmm. Because he built it off of my faith. Not off of missionary or whatever, church or whatsoever, apostolic so-and-so. He built it off the fact that I confess with my mouth, I believed in my heart, I was convinced in my mind mm -hmm. that there was a need for me to have a relationship with God through his son Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he sent his son while I was yet a sinner and while I was yet in sin. Here's the thing, before we even came in the world, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. Over 2,000 plus years ago, before and one of us that are living in this 21st century were even thought of or our parents even came into existence, in eternity past, God thought about us and thought so much about us that when Jesus came and was ready to get to the impending death that he was coming here for, when he looked in the cup and saw you and I, instead of going according to his will, he said, nevertheless, thy will. Because he accepted the will that his father gave him, he was born to die that he may live again so that we might live. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So now in that progressive state, I, get, I begin to learn just like a baby. Now, mama got to wean me from now being on the breast, and she got to now change the nipple so that I can get used to the nipple now that's on the bottle because she won't be able to feed me with her breast always because I'm going to begin to grow. I'm getting larger. I'm going to begin to form some teeth in my mouth. Same thing in the spiritual realm. When you first come in, you're always up under your pastor. You're always in Bible class. Anytime something going on at the church, you are willing to do whatever they want you to do. But as you begin to grow, you begin to now get to a place you get beside yourself. You think you got it. Think you know it now. Got you a little piece of paper that says you're grown. You can walk by yourself and you don't need to hold mama's hand. You ain't got to walk holding on to the wall. That's how some of us are spiritually. Now that we have got our sea legs under us, and even though the waves now are 30 foot seas, 10 foot seas, 7 foot seas, we can handle walking on the deck of a boat without falling down and vomiting now because we feel we're strong enough to make it, but don't understand we still got to have somebody to lead us. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense, y'all? Amen. Is, is, is this making sense anyway? Because, see, in this thing, we, we have to understand that our position is safe. 
So that means my position at that moment, I become perfect the moment that I receive salvation. I mature, but I have to realize that I got to continue maturing after I mature. Uh -huh. Although I arrive, I have not yet ascertained. Uh -huh. Am I making sense? In other words, I ain't got it all yet. Uh -huh. But at that moment, if I were to die, right after confessing, because I genuinely believed and accepted Christ in, if I were to die, I'm sealed in salvation till Christ come. But in the fact that now, intermediately, I'm still alive, I got to begin to live unto him. In other words, I got to act like who my father I say is. All my children look like me and act like me. Even though that I've had an opportunity to help rear in their living, they act like me some kind of way. They have some of my mannerisms. They have some characteristics about me, whether they look like me, they act like me. In other words, you've been around me long enough, you take on my nature. So the more I learn of Christ, I take on his nature. That's why he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So if I really want to be a disciple and learn of Christ, then I got to learn how to love folk that ain't able to be loved. I got to learn how to forgive and let go. In your progressive state of salvation where you were applying to coming to Christ, where you were ready to bust some folk upside the head, you were ready to cuss some folk out, you kept a razor blade up under your tongue, you kept a gun stuck in your purse, stuck in your panties, stuck in your pants, concealed where nobody could see it, and the moment they caught you, you pulled it out. In salvation now, you are now swift to hear and slow to speak. Mm -hmm. You wonder where I'm going with that, huh, son? See, back in the day where we were from, where uh, your grandmother and I are from, back in that day, women and men, they carried razor blades under their tongue. Now, I wasn't crazy enough to do that because I, I, I wanted my tongue. But they learned how to house it in their mouth, and they'd be in the club, and if something popped off, somebody did them something, they knew how to pull it out and put it back in. And by the time you realized that it was so sharp, you didn't even know you were cut. All you saw was blood. But now that you're saved, your weapons are not the same as the world. I'm going to make sense to y'all progressively because see, positional, I'm saved. But my practices don't line up with my position. They gave me a management position. I got a degree in management. I have a master's in managing. But I never managed on nobody's job. So I don't have the maturity or the mentality of how I handle people up under me. But I have to learn because they gave me the job. So I have the position, I have the money, but I ain't got no understanding of how to carry out the job. I've been called into ministry. I know God sent me to preach his gospel, but I don't really understand what I need to do because I don't have a sure foundation in the ministry. I have a sure foundation in my salvation, but I don't understand the purpose of ministry. Am I making sense? First part of ministry and understanding it is the fact that you're serving. And that it's not about you. So progressively, I got to learn to align my practices up with God's will. Mm -hmm. My position, I'm saved. And I go along as long as you don't aggravate me, as long as you don't agitate me, as long as you don't bother me, as long as you don't do some of the things that I don't like, I'm going to love you all day long. Mm -hmm. But the moment you rub me the wrong way, I'm going to forget, as the old folk would say, they live in religion life. Mm -hmm. So in this progressive state, my practices now have to change. He said, and be not conformed to this world. He said, and no longer be little children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. The coming in the slight of men whereby they lay and wait to deceive you. They're looking for the opportunity to pounce on you. They're playing off your emotions. They're dealing with the fact that you got some church hurt. And they're pretending that they're trying to heal you from the hurt. And basically what they're doing, they put a band-aid over what's some salve. But while they're doing it, they already injected you with what their mannerism and what their purpose is unannounced to you. Mm -hmm. Because they blinded your eyes and what they said and how smooth they were able to talk. Let me back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul said, I didn't come to you with the wisdom of men. He said, I didn't come to you with, with swift words. I didn't come to you with sweet words. I ain't come to you with the knowledge and wisdom of man, but I came to you in the demonstration and the power of God by His Spirit because of His Word. And because of that, what you saw was God and not me. And at the end of the day, I didn't want none of God's glory. Because my job was to build you. Now that you've been saved, the next part of positional salvation, if you ain't been baptized and been in the liquid grave, you need to be baptized. Because a part of the disciples, and because, because a part of being a disciple of Christ is confession and then baptism. 
and at two baptisms because that's water and spiritual. The water now signifies the death whereby you go in after entering into relationship with God through Christ. And coming up out of that, it signifies that you bury your old practices, which means that I'm not going to give them power anymore. I'm still going to struggle in my flesh. If you used to love the finest men walking around, let me help you understand what your saving self. When that's six foot two, that's six foot nine, and he's chewing like you want to pass by, your eyes still don't want to look in one. Let me help you understand. But that's where now you learn how to submit to God. So that now God now helps to control your will. If you was a weed smoker, God would take the taste from you if you was that. If you needed that for whatever your purpose was, other than medicinal for those that have cataracts, those that have other uh, neurological problems with their body that they use it for, if you're using it for recreational purposes, let me help you understand, brother, you're in the wrong place, you're in the wrong time, and you need to ask God to take it from you. Because if the purpose of it is not to be used as the medicine that it was intended, then now you are putting something in the temple of God that God has a problem when you have dirt in the temple. Right. Am I making sense? Amen. Know ye not that you're the temple of God? Mm -hmm. And if you be the temple of God, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. That's how we know we are the, are the church. And if we only went to the building and the building was the only thing that stayed clean, and if that was the only place that the Holy Spirit dwelled, we in trouble. Because he said he would not leave us comfortless. So we ain't going to just have comfort when we assemble at the house of God. When we assemble at the house, it's to build one another in the areas of life that we all are facing. Depression, aggravation, hurt, natural, mental, emotional, psychological, physical. We have been through all kinds of abuse and every form of abuse that makes up the church. And in that God have healed and delivered some folk from being a battered wife, being a battered husband, being emotionally battered, being psychologically battered, being verbally abused, physically abused, socially abused, emotionally abused, sexually abused. You, you have all of that inside the church. And when you come together for the sending of yourselves for the gaining of the knowledge and the strength of the word of God, now you help to build somebody and show them how to go through. They have been divorced more than once. They, they are facing a divorce, but they don't want a divorce. They, they come out of a bad marriage. They had to hide away in a shelter with them and their children because of the issue that happened progressively. You understand the progressive salvation that comes a whole lot. Mm -hmm. My position, I'm saved. Let me help you understand in your position and don't do away with all the issues that you got to deal with in life because you still got to face them. But he teaches you how because he gave you a guide whereby to do it. So now my weapons, I don't fight the same way. I can't give in to the same things. I learned from Joe Blow Church. And he or she done me wrong. And my eyes are always looking to see when the next one gonna do me wrong. And I feel God led me there. And now that I'm there, I hear the Spirit of God. But I'm more concerned when they're gonna show that real game. And they showed you the game that they were concerned about your soul and your glory. And they're being cautious because they know you were watching to see when they're going to hurt you. And they indirectly hurt you because they're trying not to hurt you because you're looking to get hurt. Mm -hmm. Am I helping anybody tonight? Mm -hmm. So my practices don't line up. How I handle the last friendship, when I get into a new friendship, I'm still carrying some of the weight. He said, wherefore we're compassed about with such great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight. See, there are some things that we call sin that ain't sin. They're the byproduct of the sin that we had committed prior to coming into salvation. And now in salvation, we got the weight of all these things that have been attached because of the sin that we allowed to cause us to stumble. You said we. Somebody else might be alcohol. Somebody else might be lying. Somebody else might be stealing. Somebody else might be multiple forms of cheating. Somebody else might be multiple forms of manipulation. Am I making sense tonight? So now I gotta learn now how to live without giving over my will to what I desire. I, I, I know I ain't got no business eating a whole lot of uh, food that's high in sodium, but I love the flavor. Mm -hmm. But it's gonna cause me to have my blood pressure to be elevated. Mm -hmm. Might cause me to get so high that I have a heart attack or a stroke. Or they may have to put me in the hospital and intravenously cause my blood pressure to go down by giving me some blood thinners to dilate my vessels in my heart and in my body so it causes my blood pressure to drop and reduces the size of my heart because it's overworked because my pressure is too high. Mm -hmm. 
Somebody might have been dealing with some form of stress. And everywhere they went, they were supposed to be taught how to handle stress. What was stress relievers? In your progressive part of salvation, you were guilty because you allow things to easily stress you out. But nobody helped you to recognize what triggers that brought you to the place of being stressed. In the word of God, it teaches you that. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, first of all, and I opened him and said, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross. Are you willing to take your cross up? You willing to be talked about? You willing to have your name drugged through the mud? Put on every signpost? You, you willing for your own family to say, you done lost your mind? I don't believe you done stop what you're doing. I believe it when I see it. God have you in a spiritual cocoon. Mm -hmm. And in that spiritual cocoon, he calls it a metamorphosis right before their eyes. But people are focused on what you did prior to salvation. Mm -hmm. People are focused on what you did since you've been saved. You have been a womanizer. You have been one of them that ran a whole lot of men. You, you, you was a woman that loved women and you laid down with women and God delivered you from it. And now they're watching to see when you're around women if your mannerism is still the same and if you're trying to lay down with the women that you're around. You had an issue because you, you, you learned the wrong things and you didn't know what it was to be a man. Now you won't lay down with a man but God that delivered you from it and you don't have nobody there to help you when you begin to have these urges. Brothers, if you done ran a whole lot of women, you, you need some brothers that have been there and God been delivered. you got to have somewhere, somebody that you can be accountable to. Sisters, if you had that same problem, that's called accountability and responsibility. When you made accountable for it, now you got to take the responsibility that you allowed yourself to be drawn by your lust and not tempted by God. Mm -hmm. Progressively, my practices. I used to hang around folk that that's all they did. They didn't do nothing but smoke weed. I'm a gossiper. And instead of speaking the gospel, I'm intrigued because my ears are waiting for the latest news. Let me tell you about a rare child. Let me tell you about such and such church up the street. Yeah, God, they got a lot of members, but let me tell you how they're doing it. Am I helping anybody tonight? Because see, progressively, when you used to be guilty, see, here, here's the thing. If you still stay in it, let me take you to Romans chapter 1. By the time you get past verse number 17, by the time you get down to verse number 25, God said, if you like that, he will give you to the vile affections. He will turn you to a reprobate man. The reprobate in that particular text means you will not be able to retain the thought of being drawn to receive the forgiveness from God through Christ because you love what you do. You like being a fighter. Paul, well, Saul was a fighter. But Saul knew the word. You know how many people inside the body of Christ know the word real well? Mm -hmm. Satan knows the word better than most of us, but he can't live it. You want to find somebody that really has progressively begun to allow themselves to become like Christ? They make the application of the word of God throughout the day. That's why he say we die daily. How many of us, now that we don't come after Christ, is willing to deny ourselves? Is it about you, pastor? Is it about you, deacon? Is it about you, psalmist? Is it about you, evangelist? Is it about you, apostle? you got to learn how to lay them things down because it ain't about you. Progressively, you learn mm -hmm. that this ain't never been about me. Oh, I got hurt because I was molested by my father. I was molested by my mother. My uncle molested me when I was a child. And that's why I got a problem being with a man. And that's why I don't trust a man. And that's why I chose to lay down with a woman because I got hurt somewhere along the way. And you blame everybody instead of recognizing while you were going through, somebody would have had dealt with it worse than you. But you never got up. I've been down that road, been molested. I know what it is. I understand how it feels. But somewhere along the way, you have to take responsibility. Well, God loved me. And if Jesus was there, why did he allow it? Well, first of all, he kept you while I was going through. And what should have happened didn't happen. And although they did some damage to you, he kept you in your right frame of mind. You chose to travel around the wrong corner in your mind and begin to do the things that you did. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense to anybody? You had the choice to either stay there or get up. Mm -hmm. Well, God don't like divorce and he beat you upside your head seven kind of ways, 24 hours a day, 365 days in a year. He talked to you better than the dirt on the ground and he treated the dirt on the ground better than he treats you. That's how she handling you. Yet God honors the matter. But they're both supposed to be submissive one to another. Oh, God led me to the church, and you know where I came from, Pastor. I was this and I was that. Have you proven yourself? 
Not proving that you've been called, but have you proven that you were willing to work or were you trying to force the work? Am mm -hmm. I making sense? Mm -hmm. So my practice is now go carry wherever I go if I don't change my mind. He said, you're not conformed to this world, right? But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Mm -hmm. In the church world, we do things how we want. Mm -hmm. We set our own doctrine up. Mm -hmm. We'll give you parts of what the word say, but then we're going to give you what we really want you to do. And if you don't follow what we say, we'll cut you off. Mm -hmm. We're a black ball. We're a black mission. We'll tell you everything under the sun that ain't the truth. Mm -hmm. Or we'll reach and latch on to you and suck the blood life out of you while we hold our own and while we're building what we want. Then we'll leave you for dead and say you ain't never done nothing for me in my life. Mm -hmm. That was my practices prior. That was being conformed to the world because the world practices, they will get what they can get out you and won't pay you for what you're worth. They won't tell you what you really worth, and when you recognize what you're worth, then they'll downplay your mind. Am I making sense to anybody? Anybody ever been down that road? Amen. Amen. Progressively, I'm not held guilty for it. He said, who can bring the charge? We're more than conquerors. Have you learned to conquer the world inside of you? Jesus said in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, I believe around verse number 33, he said that in this life you're going to have tribulation to be of good cheer for I overcome the world. The world that he was talking about was not on the outside, it was the natural world that we deal with on the inside, in our mind, and when he was able to conquer that, he showed us that you don't have to allow your flesh to override your spirit. Mm -hmm. Paul summed it up like this, 5th chapter Galatians. He said, if we walk in the spirit, we shall not Fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse number 16, verse 17 says that the spirit and the flesh, they war against each other, they contrary one to the other. The spirit want to please its father. The flesh want to please itself. Mm -hmm. And the father become the devil. Am I making sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. So progressively, before I get to the place that I really can get into a relationship of prayer with God, let me help somebody understand tonight, I don't care how strong you have a tongue in speaking, that don't make you more powerful in the Lord. What makes you powerful in the Lord is your humility before God, the application of the word of God to your life, and the willingness to allow the spirit of God to lead you. You can talk in 50 different tongues, but if that is no love, and there's no application of the word, it don't matter whether you can talk it or interpret it, if you can't apply the word, it means nothing. That don't make you more spiritual than nobody. Can I bring it in the word again? Mm -hmm. Sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Got a whole lot of folk that like to be seen for their much words and prayer. For their theological understanding. Let me help you out to understand theology. Theo means God. Theology means the study of. You're going to study God to the day that you die. But even though you don't have a theology degree, let me help you understand when you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God, you understand theology already. That's the first part of theology. We are all theologists because we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and God in the flesh. Came in the flesh, tabernacle, died by the flesh, rolled by the flesh, received a glorified body, went back to heaven, seated back at the right hand of the authority of God. Yes. They want to be so theologically sound and so theologically correct that they mess up some folk. Mm -hmm. They want to be so uh, Hebraically inclined. They want to be so Arabic and Arabic inclined. They want to be Syriac and Latinic and Greek inclined because they know the words and have a part of the meaning of it, but don't know how to teach you how to apply it. Mm -hmm. Knowledge without application is ignorance. Y'all do know that, right? Mm -hmm. Why well, go to school for 12 years? And when I was in high school, we had a lot of folk that graduated high school. But one of the things they didn't know, they said reading is fundamental because it was reading, writing, and arithmetic. And half of the people that I graduated with, they could not read a lick. They could not write nothing at all. And they could not understand the principles of math. So they got a diploma, but they were ignorant. Hmm. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. Those are the three foundational things to bring you to the place of the where arithmetic is now, or mathematics, or mathematical equations. Phonics. Am I making sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. So progressively, I gotta begin to alter what I do, but in order to do that, I gotta take his yoke. Can I back you up to the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew? Mm -hmm. 
In the 11th chapter, verses 28 through 30, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor. Here's the first cry for them to come to Christ. Here's the first cry for them to now receive discipleship. Here's the first cry for them to become a part of the church. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He said, I know what you're dealing with. I know what you're going through. I know where you've been. You asked me to lead you somewhere that they will feed you with knowledge and understanding, but you let somebody sweet talk you out of where you're supposed to be. I put you in position to plant you because I plucked you up, but I held you. Because you know, those of you that know anything about flowers, when you first get them, they're in the little small trays. Mm -hmm. But when you get it home, you got to transplant it out that tray into a medium sized pot so that now you shake the dirt off. You still keep the dirt that it came with because it had vital nutrients. But in order for the nutrients now to be accepted by the plant in the pot that you're getting ready to put it in with some new soil or new dirt, you got to keep some of the original dirt so that it can accept the ground that is in. Some of us, God, have transplanted and put us in another pot, but we have allowed our roots now to go out. We stay in the same spot, crunched up, and that's why we can't go nowhere. I hope I'm making sense tonight. Because, see, progressively, i, I got to change my practices, my mannerism. My mannerism got to change. I, I can't think with people and make them think that I like them when I know I can't stand the ground they walk on. i got to stop letting folks saying the Lord said, the Lord led, and by the time I get that and I don't like what's going on because I can't make my agenda be the agenda that all right what's going on, or I haven't told people that I'm in control, that I'm in charge, and now when it's brought out and shown now, I took my tail and I run, but I talk about it a while ago. But you said God told you. Practices. This is what you did when you were worried. This is what you did in the beginning of your salvation. And as you grow in salvation, you begin to lay these things aside. He said, wherefore, we're compassed about with such great part of witness. Let us lay aside every way. These are the things that were weights in your life. You let people make you think you were ignorant. You let people think because you had a physical impairment that that meant you were spiritually impaired. But what you had, you were more spiritually inclined than they were naturally able to do because your spirit man understood what the flesh couldn't handle. Mm -hmm. Can I take you the word again? Mm -hmm. Paul said to the church at Corinth when they asked him the questions about what we're talking about in progressive salvation, positional salvation, and complete salvation. He had the questions answered to them because he said, you're wondering why God didn't call all these intellectual folk because what's going to happen to people take on the nature of the priest and if all he is about show, that's all he's going to do but you ain't got no power. Paul said in Romans, and I'm going to bring you back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Let me bring you to Romans real quick, but 1 Corinthians chapter 1, but let me bring you back to Romans. He said they're denying the power of hell. They're going about establishing their own righteousness. Mm -hmm. But denying the power, what power? The word. The word is what keeps you consistent, and the word is what keeps you alive, and the word is what calls you to live the way God said live. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm going to live so God can use me every day and every hour. But every day and every hour, when the opportunity afford itself for you to take God's glory, you want to take his glory on you. Jesus. We'll take you back to Matthew chapter 6. Then I'm going to bring you back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You just like them folk, they, they seem, but they much speaking. They seem because they think they got it all together. They seem because they're given to this one, they're given to that one, they're given their arms, and they ain't doing it in secret so that their father would see in secret would reward them openly. They got their reward before men. They acknowledge in all of the plaques that they got because of all of the learning they received. They acknowledge in all of the fact of who they helped. They ain't had no clothes, so child, I took the shirt off of my back. I took the shoes off of my feet. You know I got 75 pair at home, so this pair right here wasn't going to hurt nothing. Come on, y'all. They got their reward. He said, that's why he ain't chosen me to prove you. They want to get up and they, they're excellent and they're eloquent speech. Because they can orotate, but they're not the oracles of God. There's a difference in orotating and being an oracle. Let me put it to you like this. An oracle is that which God decides to use, and it doesn't speak as it wants to speak. It speaks as it is led to speak. That's the simplest definition I can give you. As God gave to the Son, the Son gave to the Spirit, the Spirit in turn began to give it unto you, but you changed the words into yours because you want people to think you said it and give God partial credit while you take all of God's credit. 
He said, that's why many wise and many prudent folks. See, all of these rich folk, it, it ain't about how much money you got. See, we want to run to where the lavish ministries, and it look like it is growing and it's flourishing. They got a whole lot of people there, and they got all kind of programs going on, and they're doing this, that, and that under the sun. And there's nothing wrong with it, but is it really benefiting the people? Is anybody really growing? Has anybody really been delivered? Everybody's saying we the same folk in the prayer line, having the same prayer prayed over them, and saying the Lord can heal them of the same thing. Let me help you progressively in your salvation when you begin to learn about God and the workings of the Spirit of God, God don't have to do His job twice. If it happens twice, what happened was when He delivered you from whatever spirit that had you with an infirmity, you did not fill the house with the Word and the Spirit of God so that when the Spirit that left went into a far country and found some other things worse than it was, it could not attach itself because it had been detached completely, it had no access. So for it to gain access, it had to now attach itself to the new things that were coming in order to get inside you and you being controlled the same way you were before, but it's disguised by some new mess. Can I help us get delivered tonight? Progressively we learn and we recognize the workings of the enemy because when God can heal you from it, the only way you go back to it is if you don't still the steady march going forward and stay away from the thing that brought you to it in the first place. If I'm going to hang around a bunch of men that run women, and I know I was a whore at one time, and I know what I was, I know what I did, I know what I liked, I know what my taste was, and I stay hanging around it while I'm trying to live the way God said live. Sooner or later, I'm going to begin to take a bite. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a taste. Y'all y'all pray with me tonight? Y'all understand progressively what happens when I begin to change my mind? Because see, the world say, as long as you are right with God and ask God for forgiveness, you can do whatever you want to do in your body. Ministry now is all about you staying in the same state, living the same lifestyle, but blessing and praising God and just asking God for forgiveness while you live the same way. Let me help us understand progressively when you begin to learn about God and understand what praise and worship is. And the first part of praise is prayer. Mm -hmm. That's the preparation to be able to begin to sing praises unto God where you ain't worried about how you sound. You got the sound of a sound bird and the voice of an angel and you can move all heaven and earth. But it ain't about that because you're really trying to get God to bring you into his presence where he now can cause your voice to really be able to reciprocate the things that are there to bring some healing, deliverance, and breakthrough. You can't bring nothing off nobody if you're going to sing it the way you want to sing it and you ain't got out of self. Progressively, as I begin to learn and, and I begin to now no longer conform to this world, I'm not performing when I get up. It ain't about what my clothes look like, as long as I'm decent. What I'm saying now is I can wear the same type of clothes that I wore to the club. I can still sag. I can have it tight. I can have everything half exposed as long as the most important intricate parts are not literally short. But I can wear it all I want and I'm tempting for with it. There's no chastity about my now living. Now that I'm saved, I don't carry the same weight. I don't have the same slick talk. That's why Paul said, I didn't come to you with excellence of speech. I didn't come to you with the wisdom of men. But I came to you in demonstration and power. That's chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Back in chapter 1, he said, listen, that's why God didn't choose many prudent than folk. Many wise folk. Many rich folk, many educated folk. God will take somebody that got Down syndrome and have them preach a message greater than somebody that ain't got no mental incapability at all, that have no interruptions in their process. They are not disfigured at all. That's why he didn't choose all of the sons of Jesse because they look good. They look like kings and warriors. But he chose somebody that had no problem being who they were, took them out of the dirt and put them in the palace. Come on, y'all. Your greatest CEOs never finished college. That's right. The Bill Gates ain't never got a college degree, but they're multi-billionaires mm -hmm. a hundred times over. Mm -hmm. They learn the process of working, but they learn the process of salvation. Mm -hmm. Am I helping anybody tonight? Mm -hmm. See, progressively, we learn to take off. I used this last week, a week before last, with the babies. 
in Shrek when Shrek and Duncan and Part 1 are Shrek and they were getting ready to go to the castle to try to rescue Fiona for, 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 for the would-be kid. And while they were going there, Duncan wanted to understand Shrek and the only way Shrek could get Duncan to understand who he was, he said, listen, ogres are like onions because they got legs. Duncan, just like some people always go run their mouth, why not a parfait? Why an onion? Parfait tastes better and smells better. But the onion, as it begins to now be plucked from the root, begins to die after it's been peeled open, but it's still got layers to get to the center. But as it progressively died, there's a smell that permeates off of it. In your progressive part of salvation, you die daily, so there's a smell that emits off you. What kind of smell would each layer that you take off, people are really smelling? Is it the fragrance of God, or is it your own man-made fragrance, or what you want people to smell that's supposed to be an imitation of the smell of God? Y'all do know they got all of these uh, companies out there now, and you got different forms of perfume. When you got the oil, and you got the cheap brand, you can buy it for a dollar, buy it for five dollars. But the brand that actually has the right smell to it, and all the chemicals that make it be what it is, so it matches with your body chemistry, you gonna pay anywhere from twenty-five to five hundred dollars for the right kind of perfume off the loan. Am I right? Mm -hmm. But you can get the cheap brand, and it only lasts for so long. But depending on what your body chemistry is, because of what you feed your body, what you ingest in your stomach, now lodges in the cellular structure of your body, houses in your muscle and the fatty tissue, and when you produce this other chemical with it, it will produce a smell that's funky. Mm -hmm. So instead of smelling like lava field, you smell like a landfill. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. Because he said in Ephesians chapter 4, let me show you how this progressive thing go on, because he showed us Christian conduct. He showed us how to live. He said, the just shall live by faith. What kind of faith you got? Because in order to receive salvation, Paul said in the 10th chapter of Romans, let me jump ahead a little bit. He said in Romans chapter 10, he said, so then faith coming by hearing and whatever heard the word of God. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 31 to 34, God said he was going to put it in the inward parts. Mm -hmm. So when you came here, you had a knowledge of who God was. So you had to learn God. A disciple is a learner. And as I learned Christ and mature in Christ, I'm teaching somebody else this while I'm going to the next level in faith. Because the next level in faith, I'm going to deal with some different issues. Some of y'all still in preschool. Mm. Y'all ain't made it to head start, y'all in preschool. Definitely. You ain't made it to pre-K. You ain't made it to kindergarten because you ain't trying to grow up. Mm. You satisfied where you are. Mm -hmm. Progressively, we're supposed to be growing. Mm -hmm. Closer to him. Mm -hmm. We're ever banging about the dying of our Lord in our bodies every day. We're going to be persecuted. He said, anyone that lives godly, check it out, 2 Timothy chapter 3, somewhere around verse 11 and verse 12, he said, anybody that shall live godly shall suffer persecution. Mm -hmm. Is the persecution because you really made the application of the word, or is the persecution came because you applied your word while you tried to cover up with the word? Mm. Wow. Am I making sense to anybody? Oh, yeah. I want you to come to me. I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. But what I really want is what you got. I really don't have it, so I'm going to your coattail. Name drivers. Y'all know how folk will get close to you because you know somebody? Mm -hmm. You got access to somebody? Mm -hmm. They want access to what you got? So they'll be freeing you because of what you have? You know, as children, you had the best toy. And the neighborhood bully didn't like you at all till his mama couldn't afford the toy your mama bought. So now he can become your best friend. Mm -hmm. And when he's doing unbeknownst to you thinking him being your friend or she being your friend, they still bully you to get your toy. Mm -hmm. Until you finally give them the authority to take your toy home with them. You stuck. Come on, y'all. You let somebody pimp your anointing. You let somebody pimp your gift. You let somebody play with you so much that they put you in front of things and watch you fall and they laugh. And they say, you ain't doing like I showed you. I gave you the guideline. No, you gave me a premise of what you wanted me to do, but you never taught me how to do it, and you put me in a wall, and I didn't even know how to tread the wall. Mm -hmm. You're taking me swimming, but I don't know how to swim. Mm -hmm. 
And instead of taking me to a place where there are walls around the side for you to teach me how to, first of all, get familiar with the water, get comfortable with the water, get relaxed being in the water, and feel safe in the water, then you can begin to show me how to deal with the water. In other words, you just threw me in 12 foot. See, where I'm from down the body in Gibson, well, I, I hate to say where I come from, they put us in the, in the boat, put us in the middle of the body. And at that time, the body wasn't as small as it is down in Gibson. It was wider than what it is and deeper than what it is. I mean, right there on Sam Rap, where my mom and them come from off the ground there, they brought us out there and threw us in the body. Now, they didn't leave us, but they told us to swim out. You had to fight your way till you learned how to swim. But they were there and got to protect you. Some folks throw you in the water and walk off. Somebody going to catch that. They so busy worried about saving their own life, they ain't concerned about your soul. They done hurt you 50 times over and ain't done nothing to now heal your soul. Mm. They done played with you so much, you ain't worth nothing to nobody else. Because you ain't trying to see the worth that you got. You'd rather sit at home and play on your own. Mm -hmm. Progressive. In this walk of salvation, you're no longer a child. You grow up because as that child now begin to mature from being an infant to being a toddler, to being an adolescent, to being a preteen, to being a teen, to being a pre-adult, to being an adult, that's the same thing in your spiritual walk. Because there's certain things that you have to ingest to make sure that you continue to gain strength. There's certain life lessons that you have to learn so you don't keep running into the same types of walls. You don't run into the same type of situations. You help them to learn what's best for them. You want to know what your purpose is? What's the thing that you always go back to that you enjoy doing? Who are the people that you enjoy working with the most? And now somebody that told you you're supposed to be prophesying and God told you you should be evangelizing. Uh-oh. That's a part of the gift, y'all. But you ain't going to operate in that all the time. That's why Paul said, I will not have you ignorant, brother, concerning spiritual gifts. He said, let me help you understand this thing right here. Before you can go off, because everybody thinks that they're so gifted that they're more than everybody else, they're stronger than everybody else, and now they're messing everybody up while they're mess they up and don't even recognize that they're messed up. Mm -hmm. And then when God tries to instruct them and get them back where they need to be, stabilize their foundation, and fortify their infrastructure, they fight against what is true because they convince themselves of a lie. Mm. So they find for me, like-minded folk. Y'all do you know that, right? Mm -hmm. Paul said, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separated. The old folks said, like they said, birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. Like-minded folk going to do the same thing. That's why he said, be in the same mind, same judgment, thinking the same things. In the body of Christ, progressively as you begin to grow because your practices are like that in the world. When you first got in Christ that's the kind of folk that you hung around. That's the kind of spirits that you got. That's the nature you took from the leader that you had or the leaders that you were under. So now when God place you out and send you out to establish a ministry instead of you changing who you are and what you did and changing your practices into the practices of God, you carry these same practices where you go and you manipulate folk along the way. And the only one benefiting is you. Your belly getting fat. Your pocket getting fat. Your clothes are nice. Because see, as you progressively learn, I'm going to bring it to a close. When I go here, we'll pick back up next week. Lord, allow us to live. See, Paul said that you got to learn how to be shamefaced. Mm -hmm. See, women now, because you can afford the real diamonds and you ain't got cubics or cornea, you go to church with all of your diamonds on. You can afford the fancy hairstyles. And what you're doing when you get in church, now you're making those that can't afford it look bad. You can afford the $500 Chanel. Mm -hmm. You can afford the $1,000 Louis. You can afford doing your births. But instead of you being humble with what you're doing so that you can show others how to get what you got, you're showing it off and making them feel bad. Amen. You're talking them down instead of lifting them up. Mm -hmm. Like minded folk, because that's the way you acted, you attract the same type of leaders. You attract the same type of preachers. You hang around the same type of prophets. You hang around the same type of pastors. Are y'all going to pray with me? We let, see, Satan ain't got to do nothing to mess the church up because the church messing itself up and we give Satan all the credit for what we're doing because we allow him to give us the power to do what we're doing to mess ourselves up. Instead of being many members and one body members one of another, we're divided among ourselves. He said, there ought not be no schisms among us. 
Should be no divisions. You're right. Satan and dividing us without even giving us division because we don't allow ourselves to divide ourselves and we say as other ministers. So he sits back and And you give him credit. You know how somebody tell you they done done something knowing doing well they ain't do it? They done told you they ain't been they, they been lost in virginity a long time ago. And they still a virgin, but they got all of these stories to tell you that they're not. And you go lay down with somebody, and now you done lost yours, and now you got a baby, or you got a disease, that you take a medicine for the rest of your life, and they sit back laughing, and they ain't never done nothing, but they made you believe. Man, I was just fooling with you. You believe the story I told? You allowed them to deceive you, because you gave them the access and power to your mind to do it. Same thing in the body of Christ. Pure. Untouched. That's what it means. Am I helping anybody tonight? Yes, Lord. Because progressively, you got to come out of these things. Uh -huh. Are you willing to stay where you are? Mm -hmm. You still conform to the world. Mm -hmm. Why are you living in the church? You saw what you look like in the glass. Mm -hmm. You walked off and forgot what your hairstyle was. Mm -hmm. We want to be hats. It's a fashion show in the house of God. Not all of looking good. Let me make that clear. But if all you're concerned about is the type of suit you got on and you got a pair of red bottom shoes, that was money you could have put somewhere else. That's right. You're riding around in the midnight, but you're living in a two bedroom shack. Amen. Where is the wisdom? I know that's right. Wisdom, Solomon said, she cried out in the street. Mm -hmm. She's searching you out and you running from her. See, the first part of what Solomon told was told by David, his father, that he told his son, he said, beware of the strange woman. The first thing that we think about that is literally means, first of all, a woman. Be spare of the strange woman. In other words, beware of the seduction that comes with it. So it ain't always really a woman. Because it's going to seduce you to get in the bed, and when you get in the bed, you go to hell. That's right. How am I going to hell? My whole life has now went down the drain. Because I gave my power, my strength over to the bed that I laid in. That happens in ministry too. Am I having anybody tonight? Mm -hmm. God just took me there. Because I want you to understand tonight, this ain't about us. God chose us. He don't need us, but he chose us. That's why he had David to write, what is man? Good, mm -hmm. somebody was saying something. I can stop. He said, what is man? Mm -hmm. That God is mindful of him. God don't need you. He don't need me. Jesus chose to die for you. Why do you think you all that? That's right. You want the big name and people exclaim your name. But behind closed doors, you lay down with everything. You pick up the word when it sound good to sound good to the people to manipulate the people to get what you want. I'm sorry. You ain't got to pay for this religion. You ain't got to pay for this gift. That's what happened. Simon thought that if he would have bought what he saw the apostles had, the seven sons of Sceva thought that they could just go and cast out demons in the name of Jesus, but they had no relationship. You go play with the demons if you will, and they're going to make you look like a fool. Amen. God is intelligent. And why are we trying to play the intelligence of God? God can play your intelligence and made you look like a plum jack. Mm -hmm. Progressive part of salvation. We die daily throughout the day. Oh, On your job. Well, I ain't passed in the church and they ain't letting me preach. Well, God gave you a platform wherever you go because you're ministers of reconciliation. He said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, now all things become new. He has given us this ministry of reconciliation. It is our job to reconcile man or help man come back to God. God was reconciling us to himself while Christ was here. And since he gone him back, the spirit of God still does the work through us. It is our job to show forth how to get back in right relationship, how to line back up. Those of you that drive a car, you get a knot in one of your tires on the car, whether it be on the front side or the back side, front right, front left, back right, back left. If there's an egg in the tire, the car rides out of balance. It has a lot of shake. You can tell you get to a certain speed that it level off. You shouldn't have to catch speed to level off. You ought to be leveled off before you start walking. Am I helping somebody? Progressive. 
Am I really taking off? That's why he said, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, let me show you progressively. Say in your progressive state of salvation, go to chapter 4, verse, verse 18, 19. In there, he said, it would be that you have tasted Christ. He, he, he wasn't challenging nobody's salvation. He wasn't telling the church at Ephesus that they weren't saved. What he was simply saying, if it has been, if you really have been called, you have many a call if you were chosen. You didn't put yourself in the chosen and you were what was called. You haven't fitted yourself to be a part of those that have been chosen by God because they can handle the hell that's coming, but they don't handle the hell on their own. They allow God to work the hell through them so they can handle the hell. Am I making sense? They don't make you think that they've come through and arrived. They live their arrival that they made without saying one word. Mm -hmm. So he said, now, he said, even if it be that you have learned, what's going to happen, you're going to put off the form of conversation. Mm -hmm. The word conversation in the text, the original Greek word means lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So when it said conversation, it ain't talking about you sitting down having a conversation with somebody. It's talking about your conduct of living. Mm -hmm. So he said, you will put off the form of conversation. Some of y'all walking in salvation and still living some of the same lifestyle because you have not allowed God to literally deliver you. Mm -hmm. See, so you let him to bring you to deliverance, but you didn't want all deliverance because there was still some things you wanted to enjoy. You still wanted to mess around in some form. And I ain't see, the first thing people think when they talk about messing around is a man and a woman laying down with somebody that's not their man, not their woman, not their wife, not their husband. That ain't what it is. You still want to play around with the things of the world. You want to lay in a whole lot of beds mm -hmm. and still want to go ahead. Ask me about it. It hinders your walk. It stunts your growth. The pituitary gland in the body is where it begins to emit the chemical that causes you to be the height that you are. But if there's something that now begins to block in emitting the chemicals for your body to grow, you might wind up three foot nobody. And if it's emitting too much of the growth hormone that the body needs, you might be nine foot tall, but your bone structure is weak. Mm. Are y'all going to pray with me? Jesus. You may have all the knowledge of what the word of God say, how it was written, all of the church fathers that put it together have every knowledge of all the religions of the world, but don't have the application. You are giant in knowledge, but you are midget in spirituality. Jesus. Can I help y'all tonight? Come help myself. If y'all ain't getting it, I know I know he's teaching me. I might be the vessel that the mouth talking, but I'm telling y'all, I'm getting taught tonight too. When you understand this progressive part of salvation, your practices now begin to emulate and not just formulate. Mm -hmm. Emulate means I really look and act just like it. I can formulate or formulize or begin to let me let me put it like this here. I can perpetrate real good. Because I knew how to do that back in the day. I can act real well. I done done some acting. So I know how to play the role. But see, game recognize game. Any, anybody in here ever been unsaved before they got saved? You don't think that now that you're saved, that God just turned your game recognizing game off? He helped you to understand the real game. Because see, it was disguised while you were playing the game that the enemy wanted you to play. And when Lucifer had you, and when Satan had you, now that you understand the wool been pulled off your eyes and the covers been pulled back and things are exposed now, you recognize them that's trying to pimp you in the house of God. Amen. Yes, you do. They want you to sow into them. But they ain't feeding you. You got a hundred dollar plate. Then you got a little square piece of meat on it that you paid a hundred dollars for. You got a little short piece of vegetable on the plate. And that's all you got was a war. And you paid a hundred dollars for it. Jesus. This is what happens in our no religion. Because it's not a lifestyle, it's a religion. We religiously do it every day. You religiously wake up when God gave your eyes the unction because he just spoke into your hearing and you can hear what's around you because you was at a place of unconsciousness to the world and couldn't hear nothing. But before you heard the alarm clock, you were already aroused in the You were cognizant that you had a clock set, but you didn't know the clock was going to go off. So God had to open up your hearing and bring back your body function back up to 100% because 10% your body functions while you sleep. Because there's no need for all of the functions to move because you ain't Going nowhere. God been trying to spiritually awaken some folk, and they don't want to fall to my limit in my hands on your belly. Let me activate the gift that's in you. And what they did, they imparted a demonic spirit in you. Come on, come on. And overrode the gift in you. And they pulled your gift out of you. And operated out of your gift. 
Why you died? Like, see, moss, where I'm from in Louisiana, the moss grow on the trees. It start off green. But you know that it's beginning to die because it turned gray. Mm -hmm. And whatever is attached to you, see, it done died as well and it starts to wither. Mm -hmm. That's how some folk are. They look like a real good tree. Till it's time to pull some fruit off. Let them really get in some trouble. Can they really pray their way out? No. Lord Jesus. Grandma said they can't pray their way out of a wet paper bag. Come out with you. That's what my great grandmother said. Some folk can't even fight their way out of a fight. Jesus. And not one hand been swung, and they still don't know how to fight. Progressively, Paul said, put off the formal conversation of the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts. See, the deceitfulness of the lust for flesh. The lust for man, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, those are the same things that the enemy did with Adam in the garden, that he tried that with Jesus when he was in the wilderness, that he still caused a man to fall with. So progressing in your salvation, you were saved from the penalty of sin because the lust of your eyes draws you into believing that you didn't have and you didn't own what was already yours, and he sold back to you what was yours because he stole it from you because you gave it to him. Then the lust of the flesh made you feel that it tasted better than what it did the first time you tasted it. So now you become a partaker of it the second time and it empowers you more than it did the first time and it traps you even greater. Mm -hmm. Then the pride of life makes you feel like you didn't arrive and you ain't went nowhere. Mm -hmm. You're still in the same position you was in 30 years ago. Am I helping somebody tonight? Help us, Lord. That was direct off of the hot press of heaven. Because oh, I'm going to tell you now, that ain't where my mind was going because that's where Jesus. he just took it. So when he said, put off the former conversation, have you really got rid of your old life? Do you realize every day you've taken off the layers of your old life? Yes, Lord. Let me ask y'all a question and I'm going to close out with this. Here. Can you take all your clothes off at one time? And I ain't talking under nobody's clothes. I want y'all to catch the principle. Can you take everything off at the same time? Uh -uh. No. Then can you take all of your old life that you live prior to salvation now, that you in salvation all off in one day? No. No. God bless you tonight. Any comments or questions tonight before we close out with prayer? Because I want you to understand. He said take off the form. Mm -hmm. It was corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And he said be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You got to renew the spirit of your mind throughout the day. How am I going to do that? Paul said to the church in Rome. He says I present your body as a living sacrifice. How are you really presenting your body? What kind of body have you presented to God? And when God is trying to get your body to rest and heal, are you allowing your body to rest and heal, or you got to be in front of everybody all the time? Tearing yourself down, it ain't no use for God. Because you don't think nobody else can do what God has called you to do, but he's equipped them to do it. Or did you take the time to equip them so when you were in the place to do it, they can go, oh, you dare to go, now the ministry died, because you didn't teach nobody what the ministry was all about. You didn't envision it with the vision that God gave you so they could carry the vision on, because you don't work the vision, the people work the vision, you're the shepherd. You don't beget sheep because that's bestimity. The sheep beget sheep. Your job is to lead the sheep while the sheep produce. All right. All I'm right. sorry, y'all. The Holy Ghost just took me that. All right. So how can you put off? You just said you can't take it all off at one time. Same thing with your whole life. It don't come all after one time. It's a daily process. It's, it's a progressive place to where you go. Your pot of red beans ain't red beans until you the old folk where I'm from they let them soak in some hot water at night with a cap full of cooking oil in it to help break down the bean. Then they wash the bean back off again the next day. Then they put it in some hot water to start it off. They put a little onion in it while they put some oil in it to break the bean down so that the bean now can cook down. Jesus. That's the same thing with your salvation, brothers and sisters. Sisters and brothers. I don't care who you are in divine order of God. God created man first for leadership, guidance, and protection and teaching. He created the woman for the man to understand what those were and to still be sensitive to what was going on. To recognize the working of the Uh oh, did y'all catch that? Mm -hmm. Working at it. Yes, Lord. But some folks won't jump ahead mm -hmm. of the honor of God. God ain't out of order. Mm -hmm. Satan ain't divided against his kingdom because he came from the kingdom of God. So he knew how to establish the kingdom that he had. They don't fight amongst themselves. And they don't fight against the kingdom that he has. He order for him to build it like he needs to. But we fight against the kingdom of God. And say Satan fighting against us. Well, we're fighting against Come on. God. Come on. We are all. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. There's a divine order. Have you taken over your water? Jesus. Think what he told Adam twice. He gave him dominion over the water, over the air, over the ground. Mm, mm, mm. He 
didn't have the power over it, but he told him to subdue once, manage it well, properly execute it, use it in the right fashion, go manipulate it, make sure you're wise in the decisions you make with it. But have you taken over your water? Mm, 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 mm. Do you have a God over it? That's why the enemy is even able to bring you back down to the lust of the mind. Mm. The lust of the flesh. In the power of life. When I say the lust of the mind, I'm talking about the eyes. Because in order for the mind to act, or the eyes to do what it sees, then it sees what it But the mind tells the eyes what it needs to see. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Y'all do know the old folks say, a drunk man speak a sober mind, right? Mm -hmm. What you wouldn't do when you were drunk, you do it when you are drunk. Mm. We so drunk with the excesses that we have, and we ain't even picked up no crown law. Nice. We ain't picked up no JV. We ain't picked up no Glory Goose. We ain't picked up no Cisco. We ain't picked up none of these strong drinks. Mm -hmm. But the drink of the mess that we used to be in, we drunk with it, and it overtakes us and controls us. Lord Jesus. You want a Pentecost? You ain't got to wait and tell for the Holy Ghost. He already here. Yes. All you got to do is come out of the drunkenness that you're in and give the Spirit of God access and you can have a Pentecost at any time. Check the word. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. You ain't got to take me at my word, but it's right there. So have you taken off the layers? What do you smell like? Are you really progressively coming more like Christ? What kind of presentation are you presenting to God? That's what happened with Cain and Abel, and that's why Cain slew his brother Abel, and it ain't the cocaine that's causing us to slay, it's the fact that we don't like the presentation of the gift and the offering that somebody else would offer, because they took the time to prepare themselves to offer their right to God, and God accepted it, gave you an opportunity to go back and fix yours, and we present it so he can accept it, but you didn't kill them and took their offer. All right, all right. All right. I didn't mean to go there, but that's where the Holy Ghost took it because see some of y'all thinking that cane, you can snort all the cocaine you want, but I'm going to tell you now the cane that you're snorting is the life that you're living because you're upset at somebody else's gift. Then now you're a part of something and you kill the thing that you're a part of to build what you want and then when you walk away, you die the moment you separate. All right. All right. The branch can't abide apart from the tree. He said, he that abided in me shall bring forth fruit. Yeah. But what don't abide in me and what not bringing forth fruit, check it out for yourself. The 14th chapter to the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, he said, cut it off. Yeah. Have you been cut from the vine? And thank you still growing? You're going to look green once you've been detached. But you die the moment you split apart. Yeah. And when you split apart, death intimately takes over and you will. Yeah. You look good for a few days, for a few weeks. But you lack the vitality and strength because you can't pull off the source where you once were connected. And because you're no longer connected to the right source, you're trying to connect to a source. And that source ain't connected to nothing at all. That's why it's dying. So it's trying to pull the rest of the life out of you so that it can live while you die. Oh, that was somebody's prophetic word right there. You wanted a prophetic word? There it is right there. Let me help you understand that. Yes, yes. Progressively. God ain't going to send you somewhere that he ain't equipped before you got to act Saul. Before he became Paul, the same church he was going to destroy, God spoke to the preacher first, prepared the preacher before he got there. The preacher said, you know what he was. God said, I know what he was, but he ain't that. I will change him. And there's many worse than things he got to suffer for my sake. We ain't get that prayer for him. Amen. Some of y'all still got skills on your eye. Amen. And you're walking in salvation. You don't think he gonna prep the preacher before you get where the preacher at? You don't think he done prep the church before you get to the church? You don't think he done prep the ministry before you get a part of it? You don't think God can open the eyes of a man or woman of God that you saying you be led to? Let me help us understand when you think you weren't led by God, God was still in control because Satan himself can't do nothing unless he get permission by God. So even if you're on assignment of the devil, you're really on the assignment of God because there are some things that God needs to get out of you and get to you all at the same time. But in order for you to recognize that there are some things that need to come out, he got to allow something to come in that ain't like you. Amen. Amen. I'm trying to leave it alone, y'all. Oh. I don't know if y'all feel what I feel tonight. Yes. Yes. Try the spirit of God. Because see, when God leads you somewhere progressively, it's all about changing. Your body goes through changes. 
what you look like when you was in your teens, what you look like when you was in your early 20s, what you look like in your early 30s, the body goes through altercations and it begins to change. Amen. The metabolism slows down. Uh -huh. You don't think that happens spiritually, y'all? Oh, yes. Who are we? Yes. Who are we, God? I can never leave it alone. Thank you. Any comments or questions tonight, I'm going to leave the floor open for about five or ten minutes. If you got any comments, you're more than welcome to make it. If not, we're going to get ready to close this out. You can go back on Ustream.tv, No Longer Bound is our channel. And anything you missed tonight, you can go back and catch it because it's live broadcast, but it's also being recorded and it will be saved. So you can go back and watch the broadcast later. If you have any questions, by all means, I'm not going to tell you that I know it all. But I do know one thing. If you start asking me, the Holy Spirit know how to give me what I don't have at that moment. But what I have, I'll give it unto you. Mm -hmm. And it won't cost you a dime. You ain't got to pay for this. You ain't got to pay $120 a session. You ain't got to pay a $25 registration fee and pay the, hundred, the other uh, $125 after you come for the rest of the class. It don't cost you $150 for what God gave. Jesus said, freely has it been given, freely give. He had already told people what to give into ministries, but we stop what God wants us to give because we put a price on what it is that we want because we want them to give what we want them to give instead of getting what God has already set for us to have. They came with a $500,000 donation, but you put a $500 tab on it and that's all you got. You ain't got to pay for prophecy, brothers and sisters. You ain't got to pay for prayer. It's free. Yes, so God bless you tonight. Go ahead, somebody got something to say? Uh, all I want to say this all you To God be the glory. Because he said he brought us all out of it, but he uses people to bring us out. Yes. And for you to recognize that it's all God glory. I just was the vessel. That just like your favorite cup is the cup that you drink out of all the time. The cup is no more than the vessel to get you the liquid that you want. I'm just the vessel that God chose to use to get you the spiritual liquid that you need. And the spiritual nourishment that you need to have. Because one day my eyes got to close. But I want everybody to have everything God gave me so you can continue on with the work. Because the work ain't mine. It's his work. He just chose to use me for the work. So God bless you, evangelist. Thank God for you. God bless you again. One thing I, I will not do, and I, I have a problem with glory seekers, everything you guys say, I receive it, but I give it back to God because had not God been the one doing it and he fitted me for this hour to do it, then what was given wouldn't have been able to be given. And I thank God that he chose me in spite of all that I've done, in spite of all that I've been through, even in spite of what my mind might have been at before this uh, Bible class started. So I, I appreciate it. Trust me, I'm not minimizing it, but I'm giving it back where it belongs because it's all his. I'm just a vessel. So pray our strength, pray my strength. Whatever I can do to help build you guys, all of you that are on the line tonight, all of you that are watching tonight, I have no problem. My heart is just that big. You want to know the man or the woman that's been called by God? Measure them by the heart that they have for the people. Mm -hmm. Measure them by the fact that they're willing to make the sacrifice and forget about themselves. Not that they don't take care of themselves, but they'll put themselves aside for the moment to make sure that you get what you got to get. And you'll never know that they neglected themselves. So God bless you tonight. Anybody else that's here present? Y'all got anything else? Amen. Alana, baby girl, close us out in prayer. Amen. Out of the mouth of babes, the Bible says, praises perfected. 
God bless you tonight. God keep you tonight. This has been Fire and Fuel Wednesday night Bible study. This has been the progressive part of salvation as we've been dealing with the salvation process. So I pray tonight and I thank all of you that are called tonight from Louisiana and around the world, from here in Georgia. Thank those of you that have been watching tonight. If this has blessed you anyway, just give God the glory for it. Bless him for it and make the application of it and watch your life go up. Grow up and watch you become the Christian that God called you to be. We love you until Sunday morning. Be blessed. Listen, those of you that are in Louisiana, I'll be down there with you on the 30th to close out the year with our churches down there to give instructions on what God has taken us to the new year and to build you and to grow you and to groom you into all that God has already given you. I can't give you no more than what God gave, but my job is to help you enhance what you already have and mature what He wants you to be. So until the 30th, that's when you'll see me in person, but we have Bible class again next week. So if you want to join us, by all means, join us. Be blessed. God bless you and know I genuinely love you. So until next week, be blessed.